In previous debriefs, I've heard you mention the role of muscles in compressing or expanding, um, for example, the serratus anterior's role in compressing the ribcage laterally. I was wondering how I would go about learning more regarding the roles of different muscles in compression and expansion, and how this information could be applied in exercise collection and progressing and regressing movements. This is a good question, Kyle, and I wish I had a better answer for you because I haven't come across many textbooks that look at the, because like the serratus anterior and compressing the rib cage, there's not really many textbooks that look at the proximal function of muscles and, and what they act act as. Most of them look at distal actions. So a lot of what you have to do is, and, and a great app that I like is Complete Anatomy, is you have to just look at the anatomy and see what the line of pull is on those muscles on their proximal attachment and what they would do. For example, if you look at the trapezius and you see that it attaches to the spinous process, if I pull the proximal attachment towards the distal attachment, you can see that it would be involved in contralateral rotation of the spine. So if I contract the left trapezius, my spine is going to rotate to the right. And that's because the spinous processes get pulled to the left. And, and that's really probably the best way that you can uh, appreciate proximal functioning. Now, the language of compression expansion, I would simply interchange that with concentric being compression, eccentric being equated with expansion. So you can, you can still apply the, the same principles. That language is a bit useful because it's a little bit more in line with the language used in physics when we're talking about changes of shapes and space. But interestingly enough, and, and, and I don't know where I sit with this, but if you look at the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, Really, the only thing that's compressible is gases. So when we talk about compression, we're talking about molecules getting closer together. And it's hard for that to happen in water, at least in the human body, and it's definitely damn near impossible for that to happen in solids like your bones. But gases, it can. And it makes me think, and, and you know, this is just me hypothesizing, so take that for what it's worth, is maybe that's one reason why we see a lot of concentric bias and movement restrictions in the thorax, and that's because that's where most of your gases are in your body. Um, so it's, it's tough to say to what extent we are getting compression and expansion of, of tissues and the, the human body in general. So if you want to not get lost in some of the terminology, I've been I've been gravitating a lot more to concentric, eccentric, because that's what we know. But from a physics standpoint, compression expansion makes a lot more sense. I know that I sometimes talk a lot about specific muscles, but what I think is much more useful is thinking about what type of position you're trying to get the body in and think about how the body has to change and move in order to get into the position desirable. So. You talked about the serratus anterior compressing the lateral rib cage. Well, that's a really useful thing when I do something like side bending. So if I side bend to the left, the rib cage on the left side has to be more concentric or close together so I get pulled to that side. And then on the right hand side, the rib cage has to expand and move apart. So if you think of it, in those terms, even if you are not well versed in the anatomy so much, you can, you can start to think about how I need to position the body in order to get some adaptation. So, for example, in that case of side bending, if someone has an inability to side bend to the left, you may need to increase the ability to concentrically bias the rib cage on the left and eccentrically bias or expand the rib cage on the right. And that's really the best way I would say you could go about this. So look at the anatomy, get an app like Complete Anatomy because then you can look at the three-dimensional representation of muscles a lot better and you can get angles you may not see in a typical textbook. Do that, 
do a little bit of a thought experiment to see how these these things move. And then another thing too, and this is something I need to challenge myself more on, is see if you can fact check that with research. Um, for example, there's some interesting study. I, I don't know if I will find this, so check the show notes. I may have it, I may not, where they did a extension manipulation to the thoracic spine and that increased EMG activity of the trapezius muscles, whereas a flexion manipulation did not, which makes you think that, well, then maybe increasing extension in the thoracic spine gives the trapezius more concentric bias or leverage to act, and hence the increased EMG activity. So that could be another thing you could do is to fact check yourself by also looking at some research and see if there's anything to support that. But to me, what's more important is just looking at the body, looking at how it moves, looking at how the body has to change and adapt to a given movement as opposed to sweating specific muscles. But if you're feeling frisky and you get all hot and bothered about muscles, because I do, I'm a nerd like that, look at the anatomy, see how the proximal actions would occur. And if you do that, you might have a better idea in terms of how muscle actions can influence how we move.